This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again. It's Mises Weekends. We're joined by our good friend, Dr. Bob Murphy, who's today in his office at Texas Tech. Bob, how you doing? Doing great, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Well, you know, I looked back and I noticed that we have never done a Mises Weekend show on the subject of climate change, which is a little surprising to me. Uh, and it's very much in the news. We just recently had these 13 uh, U.S. federal government agencies release their joint climate assessment uh, for which the Trump administration was immediately attacked. And, of course, we have these riots going on in France, even as we speak, which are at least in part fueled by a gasoline tax that President Macron has imposed uh, to fight climate change. So I thought it was a good time to, to bring up the issue. But I want to just set it up a little bit this way with you, Bob. You know, there's a lot of questions behind the science itself. That interests me less than the politics and the economics of the whole climate change movement. So, so we have a few questions to consider to, to get out of the way. First and foremost, is climate change real? Is the earth really warming? Number two, if it is real and the earth really is warming, is that caused at least in part by human activity? And if number one and number two are correct, number three is, well, what do you do about it? What sort of trade-offs should we accept to stave off the danger posed by a warming uh, climate? So a, a lot of questions here, but Bob, I'd like to talk more about number three. What should we do about it? Uh, you know, give us your take, having studied this more than I have. Okay, sure. And let me just add: there's actually like a step two point five in there. Is is it suppose climate is changing and humans are partially responsible? Is it helping humanity or hurting it? Right. I mean, people just assume that. And is, wouldn't it be weird if the optimal temperature for humanity happened to be prevailing in the year eighteen hundred? You know what I mean? And so and that's not just merely a rhetorical question that uh, some of the studies on the economics of climate change do show that for modest warming, actually, it confers net benefits. So I know this is talking like a mainstream economist, but I'm just saying even on their own terms, the actual published literature, it's not obvious. So for a lot of them, they would say, oh, well, the warming that's going to happen through like the year 2050 is good. But then after that, it really starts rapidly turning around. And so we just got to, you know, get our get ahead of the curve and start slowing emissions. And just so in case your listeners are wondering, like, well, how could it help? Well, if it gets warmer, then fewer elderly people die in the winter or, you know, there's certain regions where they could you know, grow. You know, agriculture would be enhanced. Mm -hmm. Also, the more CO2 there is in the air, that's better for crops in general. OK, so, again, it's just odd how people automatically assume that. Well, warming, you know, warming temperatures are necessarily bad. And no, what, why would you have assumed that? So that that's an issue as well. So you're right. Your uh, approach is the one that I've taken. So I've been working on climate change issues for many years now. Rob Bradley, uh, who founded the Institute for Energy Research, got me into it. He actually got uh, Murray Rothbard was his Ph.D. supervisor. So Rob wasn't at UNLV. He was a different school, but they allowed you to have, an, a, you know, somebody else be your chair. And so okay. actually Rob is one of the I think if you want maybe a few people who has a, a PhD that technically Rothbard was his, his uh, supervisor. And uh, yeah, I have always, what's interesting is when I first got into it, I thought I was going to have to go to these so-called, you know, skeptic scientists or whatever, you know, deniers as they would be dismissed as. And that's not the case at all. All I do with all the work I've been doing on this, I mostly just quote stuff from the Obama administration or from the UN and say, look, at their own reports do not support the conclusion, right? So in their executive summary or their summary for policymakers and then what the New York Times runs with are these blaring headlines or like this latest national climate assessment. All you have to do is read the thing and you can see, no, actually, this doesn't support what the headline takeaway was. Right. Well, isn't that pretty sordid, though, the way they use the term denier, which is, of course, to link people who are skeptical about climate change with Holocaust deniers. Sure. So talk about a scummy rhetorical tactic. I mean, it's a shutdown term, just like racist. It's designed to say, no, 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 you're a bad person because you think bad things about this. Um, now, now, let me just ask you, and I do not know the answer to this. Does IER get any money or funding from people who might benefit from uh, climate change skepticism? So they, and I perp I generally don't know exactly who the donors are, but it's they do get money from certain companies, but it's more mid-range things. 
my understanding is that the big companies like Exxon and whatever don't fund them. They may have in the past. I'm not sure, but they don't anymore because the big oil companies actually have now bet on climate change, right? And so you know they like they get invest in natural gas and things. Right. So it's right. it is funny to me when people say stuff like, well, geez, even Exxon now supports a carbon tax. And I was like, well, because they've invested a lot in natural gas and that helps their business model now. And it squeezes, you know, the mid-level guys who actually, you know, would would, would benefit from the, the status quo. So uh, that's, I guess, my answer on that one. So, Bob, a lot of people will just say oil interests and people like the Koch brothers like to fund climate change denial because it's in their interests to continue to have an oil-based economy. Sure. I mean, that's certainly the case. So I guess given that some people would benefit from certain things, they're obviously going to pay people, you know, they're going to support stuff that helps them. And the, you know, the opposite thing is to say, well, all these people who are on the payroll of the government, the government benefits from a carbon tax and taking over the energy sector. And yet, you know, that skepticism doesn't go the other way. So, uh, you know, all I can say is as far as, you know, the work that people do, just, you know, look at it and see if, if it is, slanted because it's of the funding well, you know there would be what, what's the mistake in the in the research <laughs> so I, I would say that the average mises institute donor might be a little skeptical about it but is open to it i mean where where should a, an average person a open-minded person a person of goodwill where should they go to get past the headlines where could they go to read some science uh, about climate change, because I'm again, I'm more interested in the politics and economics beyond that. But if I wanted to look into is climate change real, is it man-made, is it harmful, wh- what would be a good place for me as a libertarian-minded guy to start? <sighs> um, I, I guess I would say something pretty safe and, and right, you know, down the middle is, is Judith Curry's blog. Um, and so she was somebody who she's a climate scientist. I don't remember off the top of my head what her exact you know area of specialization was, but I think the the big picture on her is, and I'm I'm not saying that she's the single best person, but in terms of someone who's concerned, and I get what you mean about funding and politics and whatever and ideologies, that she was you know in the in the mainstream as it were, and then just over time doubts started arising, and then when she just started raising them and saying, you know, on this particular thing, I'm not so sure. This is a slam dunk, as we've been saying. And then just the response of her colleagues just biting her head off and, you know, saying, oh, you don't want to go with those deniers, do you? That kind of stuff, you know, play ball and, you know, let's. And so I think that is, and she became more and more ostracized. And then, you know, and, and now so I don't I don't even I think the term she would use is, is a, what's called a lukewarmer. And ah. so what that means is people who. They say, yes, you know, more CO2, that's going to tra- trap more heat, the standard, you know, greenhouse effect and so forth. But it, it, just so your listeners know, Jeff, that even in these models where really bad things happen, and there's runaway climate change. That's not a mere matter of chemistry or the standard greenhouse effect. You have to have what's called positive feedbacks. So it's like, oh, is there's a little bit of the direct warming from these effects, then the polar ice caps melt, and then this happens, and da, 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 da. and so it's you know it's a bunch of things that all cascade. Where somebody else's model might say, well, no, if there's more things and there's more clouds, and maybe that reflects some of the sunlight, and maybe there's a, a negative feedback. So my my point is that it's you know they're arguing over what's gonna what's happening in these computer simulations. It's not merely extrapolating the, the historical trends that if that's all that were happening it wouldn't be catastrophic it's that they have to build in things that, you know where there where there's genuine disagreement so i think judith mm-hmm. curry is a good place to start then people can just read and and see and also just like the the tone also um let's see uh roy spencer is somebody that i think seems pretty uh you know just the tone i've seen him give talks and whatever in terms of personality uh, so th- I guess I would I would say those two, and then people can go from there. But that that's what I would say in terms of, you know, you you feel like the person doesn't have an agenda that they're honestly trying to just say well, here's what the the latest findings are. And by by me not mentioning other people, it's not that I'm saying they're all not like that. It's just I could see how you know depending on their affiliations, people might be skeptical. But it's not just the politics and the funding. I mean, think about it. There's a psychology to this. There's so much money and jobs and reputations on the line. There's almost a, a sunk cost psychology against ever admitting you were wrong. Uh, can can these scientists on either side of this, can they ever change their minds? You know, because sometimes it takes us 50 years to find out someone was disastrously wrong about someone, about something like the overpopulation stuff. 
that Paul Eric was pushing the 60s and 70s now we find out wasn't correct. Uh, there, there's, there's almost a, a, a sunk psychology to all of this. You're right, and I think that's part of the danger when it really is just this you know, empirical issue. And also, by the way, that's partly why early on – I was always trying to make sure my analyses, because number one, I'm not a climate scientist, so you know I don't know as much as these people do, but I didn't want to say, oh, the reason there shouldn't be a carbon tax is because, you know what, I've looked at it and I don't think that actually the upper troposphere is going to do blah, 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 you know, that's because that could just go the other way. And then so you certainly wouldn't want to build a, a case about, you know, the use of coercion on something like that. So that's why I've always tried to just remain agnostic and say, look, I'm just going to go with what. The, you know these own these so-called mainstream sources say, and, and you're right. The problem with demonizing the other side and as you know, calling us deniers and all these things, is that yeah, how can you walk back from that? They, they're really you know all these just rhetoric about you know this is the fundamental issue of our of our generation, and this is da da da. How can you possibly tiptoe back from that when you've made it that this is like the modern civil rights movement, like as. A, uh, Cortez is saying and so forth that it's it, they they infuse it with all sorts of different things and so yes there's no possible way psychologically they could say oh geez all those people I was demonizing is wanting to kill our grandchildren or horrible monsters it turns out they were actually trying to preserve our liberty and we were the best no one's ever going to say that how could you live with yourself if you realized you've been you've been doing that well what would they have us do if we believe the Alexandria Ocasio Cortezes of the world? What would they have us do? Because as you've pointed out, a, a carbon tax is not enough. Right. So yeah, I think you're referring. Um, I had a recent uh, IER piece on that where uh, called "Climate Interventionists Won't Stop with a Carbon Tax." So the, just the context here, Jeff, is there's a lot of economists who are generally sympathetic to the free market, might even call themselves libertarian. And they've been saying to libertarians and conservatives for a few years now, hey, guys, why don't we make a deal with the left on this carbon tax stuff? Because look at, you know, I know maybe Al Gore's crazy and whatever, but either way, as long as they agree that it's revenue neutral and that we use the receipts to lower corporate income tax or personal income tax, whatever, payroll tax, that, you know, we'll, we'll get a boost to the economy or at least it won't be a big deal and then they'll get their thing and then we'll get rid of all the cafe standards, we'll get rid of the clean power plan, we'll get rid of all these crazy top-down regulations and just put a price on carbon. And so there's lots of stuff wrong with that strategy, including that historically, you know, they're not carbon, they're not revenue neutral, that there's always a net tax hike, even in British Columbia, that the which for a few years looked like they were obeying that pledge and now they're, you know, they're cooking the books and it's a net tax hike. But beyond that, it's just going to their, own, you know, the the progressives, and I'm not going to some like crazy Marxist website or something. Just like people at Vox and so forth, they openly talk about how no, a carbon tax is just one arrow in the quiver. We have to have all sorts of regulations, uh, you know, and they, everything is on the table. It's they they want to have industrial planning that you know efficiency standards. They want to revamp the transportation sector. They want to you know have research and development funding from the government for solar and wind and batteries and blah, 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 all this other stuff. And even things like your diet, you know, that's a big thing. And then one of the most chilling aspects is how they say, wow, in terms of the, of the cost benefit and the numbers, you know, re reducing family size, you know, in terms of getting the bang for the buck. I mean, that's really great. Just something like, you know, giving contraceptive to girls in Africa and things like that. You know, that's really the best way, you know, in terms of the money you spend and how much you reduce emissions, because if, you know, if they slow population growth, the way they're looking at it, humans are just these you know, vehicles that end up putting more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So, you know, my, probably what I'm saying is this is not merely a technical matter where they're just trying to solve a negative externality with a Pagovian tax. No, they really think capitalism per se is wasteful and there's too much consumption and I, I'm not putting words in their mouth. Again, you can go to leading people from these camps who are, will openly say that, yes, we need to totally revamp the whole way our, the global economy works. And, you know, this is the civil rights movement of our time. And this is the defining issue of our generation. And, you know, they, they use this transformative language. So you can see it's kind of goofy to, to say, oh, well, but look at this report says that GDP will be 3.8 percent lower. And so da, 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 that, that's they're not thinking about it like it's not a matter of fixing a market failure, they think that markets per se are wrong. But I noticed, Bob, this always seems to come from rich, white, Western nations that have affluenza. In other words, who are we to tell billions of 
Indians or Chinese that they can't drive automobiles like we do, that they can't crank their air conditioning, that they can't enjoy air travel like us. I mean, there's a lot of hubris in this, in, in the West telling the East that they have to moderate uh, their economic aspirations. Oh, it, it definitely. And I mean, it's <laughs> I, tr- I try to shy away from it in my official writings just because I don't want to play their game and, and use, you know, late, like as they call us a denier and, and say that they're you know, the, the white man's burden kind of thing. But the way, I mean, there was recently on, on Vox, uh, Ezra Klein was interviewing Bill Gates and the initial tweet that they sent out on, you know, on Twitter to promote the interview was just, ugh, it, it was it was chilling where they say, um, one of the biggest problems the world is facing, colon, rapid population growth in Africa. Bill Gates explains why and what it will take to turn it around on Monday's episode of the Ezra Klein Show. So here's Bill Gates and Ezra Klein casually discussing how are we going to have there be fewer Africans in the future. And I mean, it, they, it, they were so tone deaf, they didn't even realize that some people were going to say, ah, oh, that's kind of not a good tweet. You know, they took it down and, re, and, and changed the, the content or the way they described it. They left the interview up. So uh, I think you're right, Jeff, that this really is a very affluent thing where the, the and, and this is what some of the nations, you know, the, the poor, less developed nations, when they go to these climate conferences, they bring these points up. They say, wait a minute, you guys are the ones, you know, Europe and the United States who put all the CO2 in the atmosphere so far. And now you're you have a high standard of living. And now you're saying that we don't get to build coal fired power plants, you know, to have the cheapest form of electricity, that we have to go up to these, you know, n- next generation things that are, are more expensive. And so that's partly why in these deals, there's pr- promises of huge amounts of money being transferred from, you know, so-called first world nation governments to the lesser developed ones as part of the package. Like, OK, go along with these emission pledges. And on the side here, we'll give you 20 billion dollars. How's that? And so, th- again, just th- that's partly why this stuff, this this engine just keeps rolling. There's all these different people who are motivated by different things. So a lot of I think people like representatives from these other governments just see a huge gravy train like, oh, this is the pretext by which. We can get the U.S. government to give us billions of dollars. Yeah, so of course, oh, I'm very concerned about climate change. Right, but it, <clears throat> we don't want people burning coal, but we also don't want them opening nuclear power plants, which doesn't produce any CO2 or, or, or raise the temperature of the atmosphere. It's, it's interesting that, that we're going to force third world countries to go directly to so-called renewables, which are inefficient and costly, as you point out. I, I mean, this is almost unbelievable. You're not going to be able to, to provide... Uh, uh, electricity for billions of people I- anytime in the near future without burning coal. Right. And and this is, I mean, that's a great point, Jeff. And this is why, again, here I'm speaking with broad strokes and obviously there, people are individuals and the casual person who just is concerned about the environment and geez, I don't know if I trust these, but I'm not talking about that. Part. I'm talking about like the committed activist groups you know who this is their this is what they do they wake up in the morning and they go do climate change all day and then they go to you know take a break and recharge that i i don't believe them when they say that they really think that you know our grandchildren or great grandchildren face mortal peril if we don't act now to slow emissions because you're right Jeff if they did believe that they would be the biggest proponents of nuclear power and they're not they refute they, they don't want there to be new power plants either and so i i don't believe them i think really they think P- americans and other westerners consume too much and they don't like right. cheap energy it's so it's not it's not that they dislike carbon intensive energy i think they don't like cheap energy period that they think that facilitates you know lifestyles uh, that they don't approve of right well but let's just take the average person in the west a, a well off person who does believe in climate change what do they really think the trade offs going to be it's just going to be that some amorphous sense of higher taxes mostly on the rich or do they really understand that what we're talking about is a deprivation of lifestyle. Who's going to turn off their air conditioning? Who's not going to drive their car when it's convenient? I mean, we're talking about real trade-offs in lifestyle, and it's easy to talk about climate change. It's not so easy to change your lifestyle. Yeah, exactly. And this also, the polling supports this too, that when you, I mean, it's a standard thing with, you know, shows the the limits of, of politics and how goofy it is and how, quote, social decisions don't make any sense, you know, compared to private ones. Where obviously, yeah, you poll a bunch of Americans and say, are you concerned about climate change? And they'll say yes. You know, I don't know what the numbers would be, but yeah, they would say yes, depending on the question it was worded. And then if you ask them, though, how much would you pay per year to, you know, help fight this? And then the number, you know, it's not a huge number. 
and especially the more you know accurately you worded it to say, would you be willing to pay such and such if it meant you know this change in global temperatures? And when you actually show them the trade off, and here's what your cutback would get you and everything, you know that it's re- it's really meaningless. So I I think you're right, Jeff, that it's people in general are concerned, and you know that's a a, a good uh, it's an admirable thing that. If someone is is led to believe, as they've just been indoctrinated since childhood, you know, for younger people as they go through school, I mean, that's all they hear is climate change, climate change, and you know, th- this is the modern social injustice of our time, and the whole fate of the planet's at stake here. I mean, yeah, of course, what what an honest good person wouldn't want to do something about that? But then when you actually show them, here's what it would entail. Yeah, all of a sudden, oh, geez, yeah, I, I don't, I kind of like my car, and and so forth. Or I like my SUV. Well, the other thing I hear is that it's not a political issue. This is a, a human rights issue or a, an issue that all humanity ought to be involved with and that there's no – that we shouldn't even be talking about this in economics terms of, of trade-offs. And then I've also heard sort of a backup argument. Hey, even if some of our predictions are wrong, it's just going to mean we'll, we'll have a cleaner environment. So that's the worst-case scenario, even if we are overstating – the, the long-term impact. Who cares? Because we'll just have a cleaner environment. This is obviously a very non-economic argument where we're not even talking about trade-offs or what could have been or the seen and the unseen, uh, but rather, hey, you know, who could be against a, a cleaner environment? So it's interesting that how successful the climate change people have been at eliminating even a discussion of what these trade-offs might look like. Yeah, and it, to me, maybe. I don't know how solid this analogy is, but I'm sure, you know, obviously Mises uh, listeners would get this. It's sort of like with socialism, how originally the claim was, oh, the socialist, you know, way of life will or method of organization will provide, you know, much better goods and services, a higher standard of living for people. And then when it was clear that that wasn't what was going to happen, that wherever socialism was implemented, obviously there was mass poverty and so forth, especially relative to what otherwise would have happened. Then it went to, oh, yeah, the problem with capitalism is, is mass production and consumerism. It, you know what I mean? So the, the argument changed. And similarly here, that, yeah, originally, because I've been in this now, let's see, uh, well, more than 10 years at least. Um, originally, the claims were that, yes, this is a slam dunk in terms of standard cost benefit analysis. There's this negative externality and da da da. And then. You know, me, I, and others were going through there and looking at their own numbers. Like, well, no, you didn't frame this correctly. Once we take into account, you know, these very practical issues, and and actually these studies show, and yeah, maybe a very modest carbon tax, but nothing on the order of what you guys are proposing. That you know, what you're saying using these standard models would be disastrous. Just a quick example: William Nordhaus, who just won the Nobel Prize in economics, you know, for his work on the economics of climate change. His own models recommend allowing for warming that's like over three degrees Celsius, whereas, you know, now that everybody knows the two degrees Celsius is the absolute limit or else we're just gambling with our fate. So that's what I'm saying is the standard economics on this stuff, even mainstream stuff, not just Austrian things, but in total main, you know, allows for much more than what everybody is now saying is the, the bare minimum we need to do. So my point, Jeff, is other economists and I were just pointing this out and then all of a sudden the goalposts moved. Now it was not. It was like, oh, well, you can't use standard cost benefit. The stuff you're saying, Jeff, that that was more like the second round after the original claims all got blown up and people realized, oh, yeah, gee, un- under most. So w- where it stands is under most middle of the road scenarios, the stuff they're proposing, even according to the you know the U.N.'s own documents, the costs in terms of, you know, forfeited output and the way you would quantify that in terms of how much lower is our lifestyle and whatever because of these measures is about a wash with, and these are the damages we would be avoiding by having lower emissions. So again, using their own model. And then they say, well, there's a lot those models don't leave out. But it was like, okay, for years we were beaten over the head and saying, you guys are deniers, the science is settled. So then mm. you start quoting from the settled science and they say, oh, well, no, those models don't have a lot in them. You, do you see what I'm saying? How it was like, wait a minute, this this is the stuff you pointed in, so we had to use these things that the UN was publishing, and then you start doing it, and they go, well, yeah, but that's you know that's incomplete. So th- the whole thing is a big farce. That that yes, it's just you know the the goalposts move that all along they know what the answer is going to be, and they'll you know adjust the rhetoric. So it's like now you would have to prove that no, there's zero percent chance this is going to happen because even the stuff they're pointing to. It's like very low probability events, but they're kind of just saying, well, but it might happen. And so why don't we just play, you know, better safe than sorry? And it's like, well, you can't 
disprove mm. something you know entirely. But again, as with so many political things, it's not a clear-eyed look at the potential costs and benefits. It's always just this narrative of good intentions, and whatever happens is almost secondary to those good intentions. And you know, I want to throw this out there, Bob. From a libertarian perspective, you almost couldn't come up with a better issue for a status mindset because it's it crosses national borders. It allows you to tax people, to regulate people. It allows you to beat up on big business. And maybe most of all, it allows you to, to blast people for their material wants. In other words, to discourage materialism. So it's a perfect issue, really, for a socialist mindset from, from the get-go. Exactly. And that's um, – who was it? Was it It was Naomi? I don't want to get the wrong – because you know how there's two Naomis running around? It was the it was the one on I think Naomi Klein w- was the one I'm thinking of, um, where she had a a thing where at first she had been skeptical of, n- not skeptical in the sense of um, you know doubting the science or but meaning she just it wasn't her her thing she was focusing on social justice issues and whatever, okay. and then uh, when she realized and, and I'm not putting words in her I'm paraphrasing but I mean this was really her position is she came out with a thing saying. I didn't realize how the environmental crusade and the fight against climate change actually is the fulfillment, you know, is a way to achieve all these other goals that I've wanted for so long, you know, and it's, it's stuff like that. And, uh, people, Ocasio-Cortez recently was talking about her green new deal and how that would be one of the chief elements in fighting inequality. And so, you know, so yes, in in their mind, these things are in, in the latest, uh, the UN document, the one that came out, I think it was what in October, mm-hmm. the, the special report from the UN on climate change and how you know various methods by which we can contain warming to 1.5 C. And by the way, let me just say, Jeff, before I forget here, the hubris involved, where we're sitting here and arguing about how warm do we want the Earth to be in the year 2100. I mean, that's just shocking, and so I just need to mention that. But my point is, even playing in their own terms and their own game, their conclusions don't follow. Um, and 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 in this document this UN document, there's all sorts of references to inequality and gender equity and all this stuff. So it's clearly the interventionist planning mindset, people who want to control others and everything is on the table. Like you say, with because everything conceivably could affect carbon dioxide emissions, you know, from mm-hmm. your, your diet. You know, that's a big thing too. Like, can we really allow people to eat meat? Because if you just look at the whole life cycle of it, you know, in order to get certain calories into your body, there's way more emissions involved if we allow for large scale, you know, uh, the meat meat sector or whatever, whatever term you want to use. Whereas it would it would cut that stuff out uh, if people just went went vegetarian. You know, in terms of that would be better for the planet in terms of global warming. I mean, this is the way they talk. Again, we've talked about family size. Everything is on the table because every area of your life, uh, you know, it involves this in, in some way. That it's not just electricity and, and transportation. It's everything. Yeah, it's very scary, the degree of control that this this mentality could give to regulators. And of course, they'll pose it as a jobs program. When you say she's got a Green New Deal, they so, they'll say, well, we're going to create all these new jobs using federal taxpayer dollars to, to install solar panels or windmills or w- whatever kind of renewable energy source. And of course, what will be unseen is the huge inefficiency in all of that, the money being taken away from taxpayers and from more productive uh, means to create energy. And the other thing, Bob, that we haven't touched on that I think is coming is – the mandated electric vehicles. I think the days of the combustion engine are marked at this point. I, I, I think they're very serious about this. Yeah, you're you're right, and it's. It, I mean, again, this it's all gets rolled up into other things that it's been a long-standing uh, clash where people who on the progressive left, for various reasons, just really like mass transit. You know, and they they really just like the idea of everyone having to rub shoulders and, you know, we're all in this together, whereas the automobile is, you know, the symbol of individualism and, no, it's just me versus the world, baby, and this is my own little domain and I'm the king inside my car. And so I think, again, that also spills into this, too, and and you're right that these a lot of these people look at the the fact that Americans are driving around in cars, it just, it it bothers them. And, And this, too, you see, like... The difference in the European versus American mentality, you know, obviously some of it's just geographical and, and densities and, you know, you could be at a certain place in, in Europe and, and get around without a car, whereas in the U.S. that's really not practical for most places. But, I mean, partly why the if people have seen how cars are different in Europe, it's partly because their fuel taxes are so high. You know, it's, it's mm-hmm. a totally rational 
outcome of their incentives they face. The, yeah, the consumers over there, fuel taxes are ridiculously high. And that's partly what's fueling, obviously, these protests now in France. So I, I think you're right, Jeff, that th- this this is not just merely a technical matter of, well, gee, there's this negative externality and we put this little tax in place and that should fix it. It really is a clash of worldviews and what people's b- deeper value judgments are. And a lot of people don't like the idea of people having the autonomy that a, a car gives them. Well, I'll just leave it with this, Bob. I think the burden of proof ought to lie with those who want to radically remake our entire economy based on this theory. Don't you agree? I mean, this is, what we're talking about is a really radical deconstruction of American society and, and really Western industrial society. Now, the left has always wanted this for lots of different reasons over many, many decades, but now they've got a new bright, shiny object. And the idea that we should, that those of us who are a little skeptical about this ought to bear the burden of proof uh, seems to me upside down. Exactly. And that's unfortunate why, you know, this this rhetoric, they've done just such a great job of, you know, claiming there's this consensus and labeling people deniers. And then, of course, you get, you know, some GOP politician who comes out and says something that's, that doesn't sound like the most nuanced thing of all time, (laughs) you know, in terms of just making some, you know, and, and then they can grab that and make it look like, oh, anybody who opposes us, it's because he thinks just like this GOP senator who obviously, you know, it's not up to speed on the latest you know, IPCC report and that kind of stuff. So it, it is yeah. they they do a great job of marketing and, you know, framing the issue. I mean, even things like they'll they'll call it dirty versus clean energy. And I've seen other people who really don't have a dog in the fight. They just adopted that terminology. I mean, so now I mean, imagine, oh, wait, I'm going to make the case for dirty energy. You know what I mean? And stuff like that where <laughs> or, or, you know, CO2 is now a pollutant. When no, this is you know it's 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 odorless. You can't see it's invisible. It's what plants breathe, and all of a sudden now people are thinking of it like it's like dumping sludge in the river or something. Yeah, it really is incredible how uh, the statists control the narrative, and that's really our challenge is to is to seize that narrative or at least chip away at it. And Bob, I hope you know why don't you and I revisit this in a year or two? We'll see how uh, Trump does opposing his own administration's report, and we'll see whether this plays a big role in the 2020 presidential election. So that said, ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. And Bob, we thank you for your time. Thanks for having me, Jeff. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.